in our hearts and our, our minds. As we fix our thoughts on you, Lord, we, we ask you to take the place in our hearts, that place that you have purchased and you have paid for. And it's the one place where we're at home. And so, Lord, we commit our worship into your hands.
sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king of love our king
Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead
was at rehab this week, and boy, do I feel better. But one of the things that we were looking at as we uh, spent time just looking at the Word, we were looking and considering the fact that, um, and this was the question that came up, and I know it was God. The question that came up was this. Why did Jesus die on the cross? And, you know, if I were to ask that to the collective here, everybody would come up with an answer. The number one answer would be, can anybody help me? Yes, to forgive us of our sins. He died for our sins on the cross. And that's a beautiful thing, an overwhelming thing. I can't even wrap my mind all around that, but that's not what we were, we were focusing on. Yes, he died for the sins of the world. But more, more, more than that, it was that we might have a connection again. And that without any thought to our circumstance or our situation, without any regard to whatever it is we're going through at the moment, because he rose again on the third day, he always gives us hope. And it's one thing to be forgiven of your sins, and that, for me, is just unbelievable and, and mind-numbing. But when he adds on top of that hope, what a glorious thing. That when faced with whatever challenge you face, he rose again that you might have. Seated above, throned on the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one.
testimony everyone overcome we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone
Now that you're here, and now that we're together, I want you to all take one ginormous deep breath. Take a huge deep breath. And breathe it out. That's good, isn't it? Isn't that good? You ever take a deep breath and then your back cracks? And you go, oh, that was nice. I, I want to remind you as you took that breath, that one came courtesy of the one that holds your breath in the palm of his hand. He loves you so much. And to give us breath. As the Apostle Paul said in Acts 17, he said, in him we live and we move, we breathe. I mean, we have our being. And we thank him for the breath. Every breath that we take, every move we make, <laughs> every step, yeah, he'll be watching us. God is good. Would you take just a second, stand up, turn around, and greet each other this morning? Please. We set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your children.
Good morning, Refuge family. Let's go ahead. We'll take our seats and get started with our service today. Uh, one of the things I want to remind you, um, I was going to go ahead and have um, the gal put it up on the stage it, or on the screens, is to make sure that you turn your face, go to Facebook and share it live. We do have quite a few people that actually are able, when they can't make it to church, they've been blessed by being able to watch live. So I went on my page and I went ahead and I shared it. So if you could do the same for me, that would be great. I say that because we have a few people watching online that aren't able to be here and we're actually going to be praying for them. Uh, we have the Emmerichs. Uh, they normally sit over on this side. They have three children, one in the junior high high school group, one in the toddler, and one who just ended up coming to the nursery a few weeks ago. So he was really great. His name is JJ. And we need to be praying for the Emmerichs. Uh, that's why I mention it. He went uh, this week. They had a concern that his head was a little, it was just a little large. And, and she says, you know, obviously you don't think anything of it. We never did because Howard's got that big old head. And so our kids were born with these big heads. So you don't think too much of it. But um, they just thought, you know what, let's check this out. The doctor thought, let's, uh, this is something I really want to look into. And they've determined that he has a cyst. Uh, in his head. It's not affecting his brain at this time, but they are running more tests to determine what it is that they're going to be doing and how to treat this should anything need to be done. So if you can definitely be praying for the Emmerichs. I know Heather's just beside herself um, in, in one sense, trust in the Lord, but in the other sense, it's your child. And um, I, know, I know and I understand the panic, so uh, I can relate to that. So if you could be praying for them, as well as for Shauna. Now, Shauna had a baby two months ago, and by golly, she just said, you know, here we go again. I've got one kid that gets well and the other one that gets sick. So if you could be praying for her, she's just trying to just get out of the house and just try to get to church uh, with three little ones in tow as her husband works on Sundays. Uh, but the reason I want to mention her is that she's watching live and we're going to be singing happy birthday. So Shauna, happy birthday. We're going to sing to you in a minute. We don't want you to miss out just because. So um, that is what's going on with things online and uh, live. With the things going on this week, remember our, our uh, home growth group is still meeting on Mondays at 630. You have the Dre's and the uh, re, um, Harrison's. I keep wanting to call you Richardson's, but <laughs> I will get it out of my brain. Uh, if you want to talk to them a little bit more in detail or find out if you haven't been in, in a while, find out what's going on for the summer as they meet up, uh, please feel free to, to contact them or, or stop by and just talk to them uh, live. Uh, for Tuesday nights, we still are meeting here regularly as scheduled for our Tuesday night meeting. It's now our, it's a recovery meeting slash midweek Bible study. Great time together, great time in the word. Uh, for those of you that have children, if you haven't been in a while, we are on break with childcare on Tuesday nights until the end of August. We'll apprise you if the, as that changes and we, we get back online with child care on Tuesday nights. Obviously, we are here on Sunday morning. I will say I am really excited because I'm teaching in the classroom today, and I'm glad I wore bright colors because um, the kids actually want to go to class today. <laughs> so I know, right? Sometimes they don't want to go and they want to sit here and listen to Pastor Howard rather than be with me. So um, I'm really excited to be in that class. But I do want to extend the invitation, especially with some of the long mo summer months and uh, with just um, the volunteers. We are um, absolutely volunteer when it comes to child care and children's ministry. So if that's you, if you're someone that would love to work with kids, maybe lend a, a helping hand in the classroom, we are always looking for for volunteers. Um, I know someone asked, are you still in need? So I decided that I'm going to mention it today and let you know that it is an absolute blast and a blessing. The curriculums are already prepared for you. You basically show up, make a craft, or teach them through the verses that are already provided for you. So if that's something you're interested in, please stop by and see me and I'll chat with you about that. We'll let you know what that entails. Um, some of the other things going on, we have our beach Bible studies uh, that took off a couple of weeks ago. We met up this past Thursday, and we actually did even more baptisms. So we want to let you know that if you are still interested and haven't yet made it out, um, we are baptizing on Thursday nights. You just need to let us know so we can prepare for you and be there. And then... Um, uh, we'll go ahead, do the baptism, and then we go ahead and we actually eat. This past week, we did not plan on doing anything special, like in, in the sense of announcing it. We, a few of us just decided to get some hot dogs. I had some hamburgers, and we brought the buns. And we ended up thinking, well, you know, those that show up early will get food. Well, we ended up with so much food, and everyone ate that we had a burger left over. So we thought, you know what, that's how it goes when we don't organize it. So this week, 
Jeff and Christine, they're kind of the catalyst behind this because I'm like, hey, just show up with your coffee. They're like, let's do it again. So what they want to do, you, you know what? Everyone give them a hand. Christine and Jeff, yeah. If you've been to the beach studies, they really are the catalyst not only for the fire pit with the s'mores and all that because we've rigged it and now we can do s'mores after study, but they, they love to get together and grill and cook and, and feast together as a family with friends. So this week they said... They mentioned and suggested Taco Thursday with carne asada and pollo and anything that goes with that. So how many of you like tacos? <laughs> Clap, let me know, yeah? Now, who thinks that they would be there for Taco Thursday? Okay, a few. All right. What we want you to do, that if you are coming, give me a call. We already have David, Gina, just so you know, if you're in here. David committed you guys to uh, beans. Yeah? Okay, good. So we <laughs> with some cheese from Mexico. So we've got that on the list. Someone's picking up a tray of carne asada. I'm going to pick up some chicken. I think Jeff and Christine are actually going to do some grilling as well. And so they'll be bringing stuff. So what we would like for you to do is let us know on the sides that you'll be bringing. So chips, if, if you are not a taco person, you want taquitos instead, feel free to do that. Guacamole, whatever it is that would go with tacos, feel free to bring it. Show up early. We'll set it up and we'll eat together before the Bible study. So that's what's going on this Thursday. Um, some of the things coming up, we have um, our trip for Israel meeting uh, next Sunday at two o'clock. So if you're on that list and your name's on there and you have an interest, you're a little bit curious about it, please make sure that you join us next week on Sunday at two o'clock. It will be at my home. Um, we'll have the packets ready with all the details, and at that point, we can just fill in, and then you can maybe make a, a decision as to whether or not you uh, this is the trip for you at, at this time in your life. So that is on Sunday. The other thing coming up is we have the men's fishing trip, August 17th and 18th. We have about 21, 22 men going on this trip. Boys, men, you know, anyone that doesn't mind being smelly and stinky for an overnight thing. But we have a few spots left. Uh, Mario said about seven. So if you're still interested in going, please let him know because there was a deposit due this past weekend, but I know he can work that out. And then um, he'll give you all the details. You'll be leaving out of San Diego on the 17th. It is an overnight uh, trip. So please let Mario know about that. Um, the last things, the few things that I want to mention, junior high, the junior high high school group, um, they are planning to do the escape room right here in Vista. What's it called, David? Uh, something, Coke Breakers. Coke Breakers. It's in Oceanside. So if you have kids in that age group, please make sure you go ahead and you see David and Gina for some more of those details. They'll fill you in. They're trying to get a count so that they can turn it in. They need to know how many kids are going. So if you want to commit to it, please go ahead, uh, stop and see them. And that way you can get the details and they can get that number in as well. Whew. Financial peace. We'll start up in the fall. I have your kits. If you're on that list, I know, Angie, isn't this a hard thing to do? You've tried doing this before, haven't you? It's like, oh, my gosh. But I just want to keep you apprised of everything. So the Financial Peace Course, we have your kits. If you've signed up, they are $100, $99. They're in the back. You can go ahead and pick that up. The details will get to you um, as you, you sign up. And I'll have Kathy and Steve contact you right away in regards to that. If you are someone that already has an old kit, it looks like now we have two, two couples or two um, uh, separate groups that have already purchased the kit and had registered to do, to do it with another group. There are special instructions. If you want to go through the seminar again with us, there's, you have to actually re-register in some way, and I'm not sure how that is. But what I will do is if you put your name on that list, I'll make sure that Kathy contacts you and gives you the link so that you can register as being part of our group and take in the course as well. So if you could go ahead and um, see me afterwards. Uh, in regards to prayer requests, um, we have Michael's aunt. Her name is Angie. She's uh, been diagnosed with stage four cancer, and we're, I'm waiting to hear. Is that accurate information? Yes, she's going to start Next week, she'll start treatment. So if you could, two weeks. So if you could be praying for Angie uh, as she goes through this, and of course for the family. Uh, we also have Mike Bedford's father who, pa uh, I'm sorry, he did not pass away. He fell. <laughs> he fell and broke some ribs, and he hasn't been doing that well. Um, we were supposed to see him this week, and we haven't gotten a chance to see him. We haven't heard back from Mike Bedford, but he had just asked that we be praying for his dad. He's 85 years old, broke a few ribs, could have been a lot worse. So if you could be praying for Mike and taking care of his dad and also for his dad for a 
complete recovery. Uh, the other person we want to be praying for, and um, Howard had asked me, he says, you know, I don't think anyone remembers her or knows who she is, but it's a friend of ours named Borka. And there are quite a few people here in the fellowship that have, have actually asked me about it. So they do know who she is. She's actually um, on hospice care, stage four cancer, started out with melanoma in her foot, and it spread to her lungs and now to her brain. So we are actually going to meet up with her this afternoon. If you could be praying for us, mainly for her, um, she, we are actually talking with her in regards to a memorial service. So if you could be lifting her up in prayer as she goes through this season in her life, as well as Tracy Duma's family. Um, we put a picture up last week. Do we have that still? Do you have that, Ab? Just in case you don't recognize it, my Tracy Duma, this gentleman right here. So people have called and actually texted to ask. He did pass away. So um, uh, we don't know anything yet in regards to a memorial service, but we'll go ahead and keep you posted. If you knew him and would like to attend uh, or want some information about that, please make sure you see myself or Pastor Howard in regards to that, and we'll fill, fill you in. And I think in regards to um, announcements, I'm done. So aside from Shauna that we're singing live, who are we? Yes. That's right. You know what? James, stage four. Full recovery for James. We've been praying for him. Stage four colon cancer, and um, they're doing the. He's responded well to the treatment, and they're going to be operating in a few weeks. So praise the Lord. See, this is why we pray. This is why we don't look with our eyes and determine with our own minds what the plan of God is. Let Him play it out. So praise the Lord, right? Um, okay. So aside from Shauna, anyone else that we're going to be singing happy birthday to? Yes, Jeff. Oh. Fractured skull, writer. Oh my goodness. Okay, remind me not to slap you upside the head in class, okay? I'll be gentle this week. All right, we need to be praying for writer <laughs> for full recovery. Okay, Pastor Howard, come on up here and help me uh, sing happy birthday not only to Shauna, who else are we celebrating? Anybody else? That's it? Yay, okay. Shauna, you're watching live, and this is just for you. There it is. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jesus loves you. Happy birthday to you. Praise the Lord. All right, you guys, we're going to go ahead and excuse the kids. Uh, you all go to your prospective classes and have a blessed study. God bless you. Well, you can tell we're in a new era when a little kid comes up to the teacher for the class and says, can I bring my phone? <laughs> yes, just don't text while you're in there, son. The usher's going to come forward and we're going to receive our tithe and offering. Things I used to do, Lord. 
that you're not supposed to use. And I remembered this song and it reminded me of this truth. Words I used to would use I don't use no more. Words I used to would use I don't use no more. Words I used to would use Lord, I don't use no more. It's been a great change since I've been born. If I have a first theme song, it would be God, You're So Good to Me, written by Terry Clark. And then if I have a second theme song, it would be this one. And the weirdest thing is, the person who wrote this sang it in German. And she's German. And I don't know how I found the song other than a friend of mine plays it. And from that point on, I just, I just borrowed it from her. I can't even remember her name. It's Rita something, I think. But if you do not have a Bible, please pick up your hand, and one of the ushers will get you one. And then once you have it, I want you to turn into uh, the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the ninth chapter this week, as we continue our book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, quest through the Bible. I don't know if you've ever spoken these words. Well, if I were in charge here, things would be different. Or maybe, you know, if I was the boss, man, we'd do things differently. Or maybe when you were younger, you said something like, you know, when I grow up and I move out, I am never 
or I will always. Are there any control freaks in the room this morning? Anybody who wants to manage life? Have you ever felt, as a control freak, I just want to ask you, have you ever felt totally out of control as a control freak? I think that for the most part, most control freaks, really the biggest, greatest frustration in their lives is how many things are really out of control and how little control they really have. Being honest with you, I think being a control freak, when things are out of your control, what the, the common rationality for the control freak when things are out of control is this. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. You end up being a slave of the circumstances. You end up being a victim of the circumstances that are going on around you. And, and a control freak will commonly say, well, if it hadn't been for you, or if it hadn't been for that, or if it hadn't been for this, everything would be fine. So if I were the boss, I would fire you, or I would change this, or I would do that. We try to control the circumstances, but the, 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 the real reality here is, and especially for our study this morning, is there are answers for you. Even if you're not a control freak and you're looking at things that are out of control even in your own life. In this account that we're about to read this morning, it, it shows up in all four Gospels. And there's not a lot of events that show up in all four Gospels. And I think it's in all four for one purpose, and that is it's important. It, it, it was important for every writer to, to get this one in there to really have this written down for us to learn from. And so I will begin, I will read, and then we will pray, and we'll begin our talk together. Picking it up in verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard all that was done by him, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. And by some, that Elijah had appeared. And by others, that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John I've beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. When the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had, been, who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get some provisions for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes or to fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and the 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. Father, this morning, we look at these accounts in your word as not just Bible stories, but we see them as something that happened, an actual event that took place. And there was never anything that you ever did that wasn't just fraught with meaning and purpose. And so, Lord, would you press your purpose into our hearts and our minds that that our lives would be changed even more, that we would be even more conformed and transformed into your image through the power of your spirit, through that cross of Christ and the risen Savior, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In verse 7, when they say that Herod is the Tetrarch, it's Luke's way of saying that he's the man who is large and in charge. He, he's pretty much, in this region, the most powerful man around. 
If he wants something done, guess what? It gets done. If somebody dies, well, it goes under his command. If somebody lives and gets a pardon, well, that's at his courtesy. That's the kind of man we're dealing with here. Whatever he wanted, he got. And he wanted, he wanted John the Baptist in prison. Why? Well, thank you for asking. He wanted John the Baptist in prison because he had the audacity in front of everyone down at the River Jordan when the multitudes were coming to be baptized to indict him to indict him for taking his brother's wife as his own. Yeah, he fell in love with Herodias, his brother's wife, and he took her for his own. She divorced her husband, his brother, Philip, and went off with him. And John the Baptist had the audacity to say that that was wrong. And of course, Herodias didn't like to hear those words. And, and can you imagine the humiliation in front of the masses? John the Baptist, who is he? Camel, hair, outfit, long hair, looking like, you know, Ozzy Osbourne uh, with a beard. He's got, he's got honey stuck in his beard and bugs caught in his beard and people are respecting him. They're saying he's a prophet of old and he has the audacity to humiliate him in front of everyone. And so he has him incarcerated. And he keeps him incarcerated for quite some time. As a matter of fact, whenever he wanted to have a spiritual discussion, guess what they did? <laughs> they brought him out of his cell and brought him into the court so that Herod could have a little spiritual pump, a little spiritual infusion. Now, we kind of breathe, breezed over the word, but I want you to look at it there in verse 7. The word was perplexed. Can you see that word, perplexed? I want you to underline that word in your Bible if you have one, or just simply put it into your mind. Diaporio is the word, and it means that he was completely and totally at a loss. In other words, Herod was freaking out. Here's the man who has all the power in the region. He has all the money in the region. He's got the history, and he's got the real estate. He's got everything anybody could ever want. But hearing what the disciples have done, and everybody is talking, they're saying, oh, John has risen from the dead. And see, this is the problem. Uh, as J.B. Phillips put it, I, I have it down here uh, in verse 7. All these things came to the ears of Herod the Tetrarch and caused him acute anxiety. So here is a guy that is a control freak who's dealing with a bit of anxiety. Mark 6, 20 in the NIV. Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. So he would hear about Jesus, you know, he, or he would hear about salvation that was being offered. He would be taught the Old Testament. He'd be taught the things of God, and he liked it, but he, he kind of feared the man. The message puts it so brilliantly. Herod was the one who had ordered the arrest of John, put him in chains, and sent him to prison at the nagging of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had provoked Herod by naming his relationship with Herodias adultery. Herodias, smoldering with hate, wanted to kill him. But he didn't dare because Herod was in awe of John, convinced that he was a holy man. He gave him special treatment. Whenever he listened to him, he was miserable with guilt. And yet, he couldn't stay away. Something in John kept pulling him back. What happened? Well, it was because of his birthday party. It was because of his birthday party, and of course Herodias' daughter, his now niece, daughter, stepdaughter, did a dance. It was a provocative dance, and sure, he'd had way too much to drink, and, and as is the case, when people have way too much to drink, they talk too much. And yeah, he made her a promise up to half of the kingdom for that dance that you just did. Here you go. And what would you want? And Sure enough, she went to her mother and mom suggested maybe we could get John the Baptist's head on a platter. And sure enough, they did. Herod had him beheaded. And now he thinks that he can shut up the voice of God. He can control things. And here he is stewing in his own anxiety. And yes, he is at a loss and he doesn't understand. But this is a classic illustration of a self 
self-centered life. Managing everything, absolutely nothing is working. That is the result. The victim of circumstance? I don't think so. Look at verse 9 one more time. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. Reality, it doesn't matter who you are or how much power you have guaranteed. That will only take you so far. I give you Herod Antipas. Kill John the Baptist, then comes Jesus. Kill Jesus, guess what comes next? The disciples. Kill the disciples, guess what comes next? The disciples of the disciples who actually become disciple makers, who make disciples of disciples, and here we are today. Herod's work comes up not once again, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the big question for you this morning is, how about you? How's it working? How's that management coming? Everything coming together perfectly for you. Everything, every piece falling into place. You just stand back and look at the great jigsaw puzzle and because of your dizzying, dizzy, dizzying intellect and your incredible prowess, you're able to put life together in such a way that the rest of us just stand back in awe. We look and just wonder how incredible you really are. How's that working for you? Perfect, there you go. No greater answer has ever been spoken. Verse 10. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. And then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. The disciples had just turned from their help, hope, and healing crusade. And it was an amazing thing. They had to be wiped out. There wasn't, if you remember, he said, no Visa card, no MasterCard, no Discover, no cash, no purse, no extra coat, no extra sandals. And as a matter of fact, wherever you end up, you cannot upgrade. There are no upgrades here. You take what you get. So naturally, they had to have been feeling a little bit thin at this moment. And I'll never forget the words of Vance Havner who said this. If we don't come apart and rest, we will just come apart. And Jesus, well aware of that, wants to take the guys and get them to breathe. I, I want to remind you that being in Christian ministry is a, like, a lot like watching a football game in a stadium. You have 22 men on the field that are in desperate need of some rest. And you have 20,000 people in the stands who are in desperate need of some exercise. So ultimately what happens is we have just a fistful of people doing a lot of the work, doing most of the work. And, and you know, refuge is no exception. I mean, we need, we need people to volunteer for our children's ministry. We need people to step up and volunteer to help us set all of this up on a Sunday morning. And I want you to know that it's important that not only do you receive from a place like this, but you're able to contribute at the same time. I'm reminded of a little rhyme. Mary had a little lamb. T'was given her to keep. But then she joined the local church, and she died for lack of sleep. This is the way, oftentimes, that ministry goes. It'll beat you up. So they get into the boat. In Matthew 14, it, when they got into the boat, they headed out, but there was one small problem. Look at verse 11. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. The scene is pretty amazing. I mean, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Sea of Galilee is probably not much bigger than Lake Hodges, if you've ever been to Lake Hodges. If you've ever seen anybody on a boat in Lake Hodges, you can see where they're headed. And if you can run fast enough, or if you have a horse or a donkey or whatever, you can begin to anticipate their direction and start heading around the corner. And yeah, there in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, this is where the Jordan River dumps into the Sea of Galilee. There the fishing village Capernaum is, Bethsaida is on the other side. And so they're heading over Beth to Bethsaida and the people can plainly see them rowing or sailing along and heading to their destination. So they start lighting out after them. So they're actually outrunning the boat. 
In Mark 6, that's what we read. The 12 are tired and overwhelmed, and they see the people coming, and what could possibly be going through their minds? I think you know. They're like, oh, great. I thought we were going to get a break. But no. Verse 11. When the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When it says that Jesus received them, it really, dechomai is the word, it means that he, he received them with open arms. So when the people started coming up as the boat was coming into land, he gets off the boat and he goes, hey, how are you? And the, I'm sure the disciples are going, oh, great, there you are. Here we are. Jesus says, hey, how are you doing? And so in Mark 6, 34, we read this. Then Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Many things. And when I, everybody say many things. Many say it again. Many Jesus had a way of, he, you know, he had a riff. He had a rap that he would do. He would constantly be repeating that. That's what the disciples took off with. They actually used his material as they went on their tour. And so he began to unfold all of this teaching, all of this teaching to all of these people. And these people are listening. And look at verse 12. When the day began to wear away. Now, think this through with me. He's talking. It's about 11, 11.30 in the morning. They land on the shore. Hey, and he begins to heal and he starts to teach. And one hour turns into two. And now we go from noon to two o'clock. And then we move from two o'clock to three o'clock. And now three o'clock has turned into five o'clock. And we begin to see at that time of year, we, the sun's starting to go down on the horizon. And, you know, it's hours and hours of teaching. And I can almost see the disciples talking amongst themselves, looking around. I could see Peter saying, I don't know about you, John, but I am hungry. I think it'd be about time to wrap this up. Don't you think? I mean, there's only, uh, I remember one person told me years ago, he said, make sure you keep it kind of brief because the mind can only retain what the hiney can endure. So you, you have to be able to keep it uh, simple and keep it short. And, and so there they are, hours and hours, verse 12 again. Then the 12 came to him and said, it was actually, uh, I believe it was, it was Andrew who walked up and said, uh, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for we are in a deserted place here. Like Jesus doesn't know where they are. Like Jesus hasn't, doesn't have a grip on the time. Like he doesn't understand. And I'm sure, you know, if, if, if I'm Andrew, I'm going to walk up and go, Jesus, man, these messages have been amazing. Really, really good. But but bro, you know, we're looking at the sun, we're looking at the people, we don't have anything, and, and I think it, it, it would be good to, to send them away. And it would be like he was expecting Jesus to look around, look at his watch, look at the sun, look at the people and go, you know what? Wow, you're right. Okay, everybody, it's time to go home. You know, Andrew and the boys, they've just reminded me that I've been waxing on a little long, so please forgive me, and why don't you all go home so you can get something to eat? But knowing Jesus, no way. He asked them, verse 13, you give them something to eat. See, in the disciples' mind, as Philip comes to Jesus and, and talks to him uh, and responds to this, this answer, this is ridiculous. It's a crazy thing to say. And I ask you a question. Why is it crazy? I'm asking. Why is it a crazy thing to say? I think it's obvious. It's obvious because there's, there's no other alternatives here. You can't go on into the dark and continue to teach. Verse 13. And they say... We have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now, uh, they assessed the problem. In their minds, they looked at the problem and they looked at what they had and they did inventory. Look at 13 again. And they said we. Everybody say we. we. Say it again. We. 
have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless, what's that word? There was three of you that were in. The rest of you, come join us. There you are. And go and buy food for all these people. Crazy idea. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, said to him, this is John 6, 8 and 9, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? I want you to take just two seconds here and think about, I want you to look at this situation through the eyes of a little boy. Can you, can you see him? I mean, this is the only thing we, we see of this little boy. And can you see him uh, listening to the conversation and realizing that he's packed a lunch and that there could be some people who are going to go without food? And he hears the problem and he looks in his bag and, and and, and here's the part that, the question that comes into mind, out of 5,000 people, and you know, whenever you get 5,000 men together, you're going to have a bunch of girls too, and whenever you get 5,000 men and women together, they are going to bring with them some children, right, some kids, and so it could have been as many as 15,000 people here. So they're doing the invite. I'm, I'm asking, out of all these people, did nobody pack a lunch? Did nobody make any provision? I mean, they are out in the middle of nowhere. Is everybody that spontaneous? I don't think so. But this little boy didn't necessarily need to hang on to what he had. That one little boy gave everything he had. He was innocent enough to think that what he had could make a difference. I want to remind you of the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and verse 5, or verse 15. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Okay, here comes a Howardism. Okay? So you need, you need to remember this. This is an important one. Never judge your problems in the light of your resources. Let me say that again. Stop judging your problems in the right of in the light of your possessions or your resources. It, 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 let me, point number one, give what you have. Just give what you have. When, when you're faced with a problem like this, just give what you have and God will bless it. I mean, think about Jesus' words there in Luke 6, 38. We read it a number of weeks ago. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, rather running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you. Because nothing that you have, no matter why, how little it is, maybe you've got lint in your pocket and that is all you have. All I'm saying this morning is simply this. Because nothing in your life is insignificant when it's placed into the hands of Jesus. Listen, your life is all about availability, not ability. We get caught up in what I'm able to do and what I can't do and what I should have done or what I could have done or what I might have done. And in, in all you have to do is today just simply be available and give him what you have. And he will do something incredible with it. Will somebody say amen? amen? It's not ability, it's availability when it comes to God. Verse 14, and Jesus, he, he loves to ramp it up another notch. He said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. Do you have any idea how hard it is to work with people? Does anybody? Does anybody in the room have any concept of how difficult it is to work with people? Now we've got 5,000 men, potentially 5,000 women, and a bunch of kids, and you're going to make them sit down in groups of 50. If there was a miracle, it was getting all those people to sit down in groups of 50. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, the weird thing about this is Jesus wants them to see. Jesus blesses their leading, and the size of the problem is in direct proportion to the size of your God. I want to say that again. For most of us, the size of the problem we face has everything to do with our perspective of the size of the God we serve. We can be overwhelmed 
by having, you know what I would say when Jesus said make them sit down in groups of 50? I would say this, Jesus, you have been talking for five hours. You make them sit down in groups of 50 because put a fork in me, I'm done. But no, he pushes the point, and they have them do it. Look at verse 15. And so they did so and made them all sit down. Number two, second point before we go. First point was simply this. Give what you have. Second point is this. Give it to Jesus. We're a Jesus kind of church. We love Jesus. I mean, we're about Jesus. We're, we're, we're not just simply about recovery or simply about restoration or simply about healing. I mean, you can be healed of one disease and end up dealing with a whole nother problem that has nothing to do with the sickness. And for some of us, the greatest sickness we endure is the sickness that nobody can diagnose. They don't understand it. And so they give it to Jesus. In John 8, 31 and 32, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in me, if you abide in me and my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, most people know that verse uh, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But they completely push out, and you shall abide in my word, and let my words abide in you. 90% of the truth being able to make you free is you agreeing with the truth and then by an act of sheer will conforming your life to the truth. Now that's not legalism, by the way. When dealing with an overwhelming circumstance, most people, this is why we have churches filled with people who live one way outside, and then talk another way inside. And I have seen this for years in my own life and experienced the struggle back and, poor, back and forth. Do we have any hypocrites in the room? Anybody? There's, see, there's a few of you, the rest of you who didn't raise your hand, yet now you've just added lying on top of your own hypocrisy. But, but let me just push this for a second. When the, the thing that God gives us is he gives each and every one of us a free will, and then he gives us the truth. But there's no way that the truth can minister to you and deliver you unless you couple the truth with your will. You have to apply your will to the truth of God, and then the change comes. Uh, nobody sat down until they agreed with Jesus, they gave it to Jesus, and then all of a the sudden, these things fell into place. This is why James 2.17 says, faith without works is dead, simply because the truth comes into my life, and my will comes into play, and I decide to live like I believe the truth, period. Boy, that was golden, and, and if you missed it, just... Listen to it online again, please. Verse 16. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. Number three. Okay, so first one, give it to God. Second one, give it to Jesus. And then the third one, get out of the way. I mean, you know what? What did the little boy do? The little boy with his sack, with his lunch. He's got some fishes and some loaves. What does he do? He gives it away, and then he gets out of the way. We don't even hear from the kid anymore. His great moment of glory in the New Testament is right there, and now he's gone. And when I say get out of the way, what I'm saying is this. Give God room to work. Let him work. If you're unsure, then don't do anything. Just wait on the Lord. For those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. There is no way to see the miracle of God if you're standing in the way. Do you know how many people get in God's way? I'll tell you how many. They're all here. We all have a tendency to jump right in and play his role for him. But the thing to do is surrender it, give it to him, and then get out of the way. Verse 16. He blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples and set before, to set before the multitudes. And so when he blessed them as they gave it to Jesus, Jesus lifts 
the, the loaves and the fish. He lifts it up and he says this. Baruch hata elichenu melech halawalam hamotzi lechem min haretz. Which means this. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. And the whole crowd, the thousands, because they know, they all said, Amen. So here we go. You're, I'm going to be Jesus for just a second, and you can be the crowd. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Halawalam Ha Motzi Lechem Min Haret. Exactly went down like that, but in volume. Because with, with Jews, it's, I, I remember when I was in Mexico, they sang that, um, that song. It was crazy. I'm sitting there on the beach, and the, the mariachis are playing, and it's this one song. And they go, Viva Mexico! And everybody goes, Viva! Like that. So everybody was around, and so I just jumped in. I was like, Viva! You know, Cavacho over in the corner, Viva! You know, I mean, I just I got sucked into the moment. You know, Viva Mexico! Viva! You know, so this is exactly what Amen goes like. It's with a thrill and with a, with a blessing. All of a sudden, every heart and every mind is fixed and focused. Yes, it's God. And then Jesus gave it back. Now the word didomai is the word we use for give it back. It's the word that it was employed. What it meant, it was in the imperfect tense. So what it means is it was an ongoing action. He kept giving. He just kept giving. It just kept coming. Everything kept multiplying in his hands. And, and as long as he had it, it kept dividing. I'm going to say that again because you needed to hear it. As long as he had it, it kept dividing. What he has divides and grows. In your life, what he has divides and grows. In your finances, what he has divides and grows. In your private time, what he has divides and grows. In your family life, in your relationship life, it'll grow, it'll deepen, it'll become more if he, if he has it in his hands. As a matter of fact, Alexander McLaren wrote these words, the pieces grew under his touch and the disciples always found his hands full when they came back with their own empty. Their hands were always filled. When they came back, his were ready to receive them. Number one, give what you have. Number two, give it to Jesus. Number three, get out of the way. Number four, and this is the best, you'll get leftovers. You will get leftovers. Look at verse 17. So they all ate and were filled, and 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. Um, you know I read a lot, and I've read a lot of commentary. I mean, you would not believe how many people extrapolate Oh, well, the 12 baskets represent the 12 tribes and the seven this. And they, they go off onto these, all these tangents. And I'm just going to say it. As far as I'm concerned, they are worthless. All those tangents, while really great gymnastics and theological, uh, you know, uh, you know hmm moments make you think, they're all fairly worthless in comparison to the point. And the point here is this. You'll always have enough when it comes to walking with him. When it comes to trusting with Jesus, when it comes to trusting him with your relationships, with your job, with your finances, with whatever you have, when it comes to, you will always have more than enough. He'll give you leftovers. You'll always have enough to carry on, to continue through. And you'll ask yourself, and this is the weirdest thing about walking with God. God is a rearview mirror kind of God. You can't see it out of the windshield. You can only ascertain it as you look in the rearview mirror. And you'll wonder, how did I get this far? But as you look in the rearview mirror, you realize that he has been dividing and multiplying and maintaining and directing and guiding my life for all of these years. It's a miracle that I'm here. Somebody say amen. Amen. You will have enough left over for your wife or your husband or for your kids. I mean, there, there is so much here for you and I. And we hold so much back from faith and from trusting. 
And, and, and so many times in my life, I'm, you know, even serving in ministry, and I'm embarrassed to say this, that I would pour out so much in what I do that I would come home and have nothing for everybody else. I mean, I, it, 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 it's a constant sometimes with me. I'm fighting being poured out for everything else and not going back to Jesus and trusting him. And a classic case was yesterday. I'm with my wife, and you know, for some reason, I, for some reason that woman loves me. I don't get it, I know, I don't understand, but she loves me and she puts up with me, and she told me yesterday in the afternoon, "Hun, I wanna spend some time with you. But I'm like, <laughs> in my mind, I didn't say it. 30 years will teach you something every now and then. But she said, I wanted to spend time with you. And I'm, I'm thinking and I'm looking at the time and I'm, I'm like, babe, I, I love you. You know I do in my mind. I'm thinking, but I, I need to be ready. I need to be prepared. I need to study. I need to be immersed. I need to concentrate. I need to focus. Because I'm ADD on steroids. I mean, I'm not even bipolar. I'm tripolar. They haven't, they haven't even figured it. They can't diagnose me. I put my therapist in therapy, by the way. But, but with all of that said, in that moment, I had a crossroads moment. And it is a question of control. And I had to ask myself, who's going to be in control on this one, fella? What, you need to prepare? Did Jesus prep with all of the loaves and fishes? Did he say, oh, hold on a second, everybody back up. I need to spend some time up on the mountain. I'll be right back. I know it's late. Give me some time. I'll come back. No. He addressed the issue when it comes. And at that moment, you have to just simply say, here's my basket, Lord. I got nothing. Here you go. Jesus, I... I, I, I Uh, okay, I'm going to serve you. I'm, I'm going to trust you with my marriage or with my kids. Or I'm going to trust you with the burden of my job. Or I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you with my money. And you know what, Lord? I'm, I'm going I'm to trust you with what I have, what you gave me. Because you, you realize that out of all of those thousands of people, do you realize there were only 12 guys that actually saw the miracle? You ever considered that? That the only guys, and, and one little boy. Can you imagine the little boy who brought his lunch watching as this is going back and forth? And he's watching more and more loaves and fish come out of that bag? He's got to be thinking... Wow, there was no explanation for it. Twelve guys and one little boy, and they were all the ones that were in. They were in. I, I, I'll end here. Jesus is enough. Jesus is absolutely enough for you. But he's, he's weird in this one way. He, he's not willing to settle for a piece. He wants the whole lunch. He, he wants the whole lunch. If I, if, if, if I were Peter and I got in the way of Andrew and that little boy in that bag of lunch, I would have broke off a piece for myself just to make sure. And see, we do this in life, don't we? Don't we do this in life? We expect so much from so many people and so little from God who is ready to supply. And all you need to do is just simply come in your control freak moment with an empty basket and say, I don't have anything, but I do have this basket. It's yours. So how's it working? Are you burnt out? or stressed out, 
Are you tired and weary? Are you broke? Or are you disgusted? Well, maybe it's time for you today to put it in Jesus' hands. See what he can do with it. I'll guarantee you this. If this story is true, and it is, he can do this with loaves and fish. What can he do with your stuff? As Alexander McLaren once said, he said, the world has yet to see what God can do with one man whose heart is fully devoted to him. Let's pray. Lord, as we face uh, so many challenges in our world, there are challenges of philosophy and challenges of theology. There are challenges of credit and finance. There are challenges in relationships. And there are opposing forces on the left and the right in our lives. But there you are, feeding the masses. And you literally spoke if anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Lord, you literally spoke, if anyone is weary and heavy laden, that you would give them rest. You literally spoke, I am the bread of life. You, you literally said, he who comes unto me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Lord, I thank you for your words. But there takes a moment where I have to, and I know this, Lord, I have to exercise my will in the light of your truth and your promise. And the will is what connects me to the transformation of the truth of your word. And this morning, once again, I'm faced with that truth. And I'm also, by your spirit, I'm also convicted that there is very little that you have of me. And so we're here. And once again, we're challenged by the presence of your spirit to recommit by an act of sheer will to you again. And I know that so many people in this room, we talk about the struggle or the crisis or the problem that we're facing. So many have a, a name or a situation or a circumstance in their mind. And they're here. And here you are, ready and willing and mighty to save if we would simply, in the moment, give it to you like a little boy with a lunch. So in this moment, you're here and we trust you, Lord. And in this moment, you that listen to the sound of my voice seated in the room, I would be completely wrong if I didn't challenge you to exercise your will this morning. Everything that separates you from him is everything that you're holding on to in your own life. And he said these words to you. If anyone desires to come after me, let him follow me. Let him take up his cross and follow me. He asks you, by just display of the will, to choose. So here you are. Are you feeling that separation and you need some life and some vibrance? You need some new life. You need to be free and delivered and clean. Are you here and is that your place? I just ask you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Some may be in this room, keep your hand up, some may be in this room, just have never really ever dedicated, never ever really committed your life to Christ. And, and today's your day. You're no fanfare, no big, you know, to do. You're just simply, quietly, just receiving the Lord and saying, yes, Lord, take me. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I, I want to pray with you as well. Anybody else? Father, I pray for all of these with hands raised. God, we ask, forgive. And Lord, I pray that you would take what we give you this morning 
and, and divide it and use it for your good and for your glory. And I pray that as we leave this place, we get behind the wheel of a car, that we would drive to your glory, that we would exercise the, the truth of your will, of your word and our will, coupling together to transform our lives. I pray that when we're challenged by people later, that we would trust in your truth and not take your job for you. But Lord, we'd give you the glory and give you that position in our life, the throne of our lives. So God, with hand raised, we're saying, save now, Lord, save now. And we thank you for the miracle of feeding your people in Jesus' name. And everybody said, God bless you guys. If you need prayer, that's why we're here. Otherwise, I'll see you on Tuesday or next Sunday or Thursday at the beach. God bless you.